brought to you courtesy of the red, white, and blue. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are and what time you're watching this lecture. It's Mr. Eschbacher. Welcome to another one of my little kitchen table classics. Uh, today we're going to talk about colonial America and uh, be a little bit more precise geographically. We're not going to talk about the New England colonies today. We're not going to talk about Chowda and Number Four Bobby O and taking the car down by the water. And we're not going to talk about the Southern colonies. That's right. It's time for the middle child. I mean the middle colonies. The Jan Brady of colonies. The mid-Atlantic colonies. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Also called the breadbasket colonies uh, because of the high levels of grain and farmland that they have there. Uh, a good way to remember these colonies is to think better eat your Quaker oats. And we'll get into that today. But when we talk about the middle colonies, let's zero in here and talk about what colonies would mean specifically. So on the AP test, you would see middle colonies, you would see the term mid-Atlantic colonies. We're talking about, that's right, New York, the Empire State, Empire State of Mind, and Concrete Jungle, where dreams are made of. We're talking about New Jersey, the colony that became a state that eventually gave us two of the greatest natural resources in American history, Bon Jovi and Bruce Springsteen. We're talking about Pennsylvania, Founded by uh, people who were famous for their oatmeal. No, just kidding. But we are talking about the Quakers today. And Delaware. Delaware, which is so small and was so obscure that uh, it didn't even have its own governor. It shared governors with New Jersey until after the, I'm sorry, with Pennsylvania, until after the American Revolution. Uh, Delaware, which was the three southernmost counties in Pennsylvania. And, well didn't give us much notoriety until, well, now the president, President Biden, is from Delaware. We're going to talk about some important people, a dude named the Duke of York. I wonder what colony he was in. Uh, Lord Berkeley and Lord Carteret of New Jersey. Some guy named William Penn. And uh, John Peter Zenger, a dude who shows up not only in the AP test, but also in the New York State Regents. When we talk about freedom of the press. And, of course, America's own Enlightenment man, Ben Franklin. So... Let's go back in time. All right, if you take a look at the notes that uh, I provided on the classroom, you're gonna see they're color coded. Anything typed out in green is going to have a connection to geography. Anything in red, religion, get it? G, green, red, religion, okay. Why, because typically speaking, whenever we do period two in A push, and we talk about colonial America, we can really hone everything into one of two things. The impact of geography on colonial America, or how geography created differences between different colonial regions. There's that great skill of comparison. Uh, or the impact of religion. And again, there, that term impact should make us think causation. Or comparing the impact or the importance of religion in different colonial regions. And if you recall, when uh, we talked about New England, we said that not only was the geography important economically, but really the biggest factor in shaping those colonies was religion. Go back and you can look over previous lectures for that. But today we are talking about the mid-Atlantic colonies. Again, the breadbasket colonies. Why? Well, I grew up in New Jersey. And besides Bon Jovi and Bruce Springsteen, we're the garden state, you know, a lot more farmland than people realize. Think about upstate New York, hop on the thruway, and as you drive across upstate New York, you're going to see a lot of farms. So temperature, the climate, a little bit milder than New England, better for the growth of grain crops or cereal crops, okay? But also great ports, Philadelphia and New York City in particular, all right? When we do talk about geography with the mid-Atlantic colonies, it's also to keep in account that one of the big ideas behind geography is this idea of movement. What factors promote human movement? What factors can hinder it? And 
at least for the earlier part of period two, there was a major factor that affected the geography of the mid-Atlantic colonies, and that was the Iroquois Confederation. And I'm sure my crack cameraman will put a map up right about now to show you where the Iroquois Confederation was located. And as a result of this very strong group of Native Americans, the Iroquois were five separate tribes. Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk, and then later on they adopted the Tuscarora. But what's important was these five separate nations united together. They formed this confederation for purposes of trade, for purposes of war. So you could think of them as a precursor not only to our Articles of Confederation, but to the European Union, to NATO. And because these five tribes united, they were very strong. And especially early in the 17th century, settlement in in the colony of New York was really limited up into the Hudson River and Mohawk River Valleys. All right, big term here, proprietary colony, something that you should be familiar with. A proprietary colony is a colony owned by an individual who basically is given his chance to run his colony his way as long as what he does stays in line with the king's laws. New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania were all proprietary colonies. New York was run by the Duke of York, the king's brother, who, you know, really, he was very powerful. He was the most important guy in the colony. You know, really can't think of another guy like that who's not a Yankee. Ball game over. Yankees win. The Yankees win. But, you know, uh, and the Duke of York, he, he was pretty harsh with how he ruled things. Eventually, the, the colonists in New York were like, great, we got rid of him, but that's because he then became the king. In New Jersey, you had Lords Carteret and Lords Berkeley, and they had two separate colonies. They really were absentee proprietors, didn't do a great job, so eventually the crown seized the colony, combined it together to make New Jersey. And, of course, we have Pennsylvania, and their famous proprietor, William Penn. We'll get into Pennsylvania in a little bit. The other thing that you need to know about the middle colonies is they are incredibly diverse. Remember, the British were not the first to colonize North America. They weren't the first to colonize the Western Hemisphere. Spain and Portugal beat them in the punch in the Western Hemisphere. But even in North America, the first permanent settlement was St. Augustine, Florida. That was a Spanish colony. The French had colonized in North America prior to the British in areas like the Champlain area in St. Lawrence River Valley, the Mississippi, the Ohio River Valley, the Dutch beat the British to the middle colonies. If you look at towns in upstate New York, I lived in Newburgh, that's a Dutch word, in Orange County, uh, which was right on the Hudson River, Henry Hudson. Uh, across the Hudson River from where I lived was Fishkill. Kill is a Dutch word for river. You can go through upstate New York and find places like Schenectady. And these are all Dutch words. The Dutch got there first. And an important point to remember about the Dutch is each European power, and we got into this a little bit with period one and two and transitioning there, but each European power had their own methods and their own motivations for colonization. And with the Dutch, it was all about the Benjamins, baby. It was all about money. The Dutch were all about the fur trade. They had good relations with natives. When the British showed up one day with their fleet off the coast of New York Harbor, they basically just took New York from the Dutch. Okay, But the Dutch, when they were there, had divided up land into these large estates called patroon ships. Kind of think about like feudal manors. In fact, if you look along upstate New York, especially as you start to go uh, up the Hudson River Valley, you kind of see at least counties and towns somewhat emulating the boundaries of these old patroon ships. Other geographic things. Um, you had the largest city in colonial America in the middle colonies. What was it, guys? Come on, easy guess. Was it the largest city? No, not New York. Philadelphia. In fact, New York's not going to be the biggest city in America until some canal thing gets built. But Philadelphia in itself was a wonder. It was an incredibly well-organized city. It was divided up into a grid-like pattern. 
because Philadelphia was the capital city of this planned colony of William Penn's that some referred to as this holy experiment. So let's lay the city out in a grid-like pattern. Let's have organized plots of green space. If you compare that with other cities in colonial America, like Baston, okay, uh, if you look at a street map of Boston and Massachusetts, it looks like somebody dumped a plate of spaghetti on the ground. You know, the roads are going all over the place. But Philadelphia was planned out in a grid-like fashion. The middle colonies were also incredibly ethnically diverse. You had a lot of mixed ethnic groups. You had the Dutch, you had the British, you had Native Americans, you had slaves. Yes, remember, there were slaves in all the 13 North American British colonies. Somewhat more slaves in the middle colonies than you did in New England. Nowhere near as many as you did in the South, but that's an important point to remember. <clears throat> in fact, it wouldn't be until 1827 when the last slaves were freed in New York. Uh, but you had other ethnic groups. You had Scotch-Irish, you had Scandinavians, you had people from mainland Europe. Uh, you had a group called the Pennsylvania Dutch, who weren't Dutch, they were actually German. Uh, you had a lot of different ethnic groups. And as a result of this, you had a very diverse culture. You also had a lot of religious diversity. Unlike New England, where Puritanism dominated so many of those colonies, no one religion was able to dominate in the middle colonies. Yes, in New York, the Anglican Church or the Church of England was the established or official or tax-supported church, but even that did not have anywhere near as strong a foothold as you saw with Puritanism in New England. Uh, let's talk about William Penn, the guy on the Quaker Oats box. So, Pennsylvania is an example of what we call a restoration colony. The colony of Pennsylvania was given to Penn to pay off his family. The king had a huge debt to Penn's family because Penn's family had helped to restore the British monarchy. So, what's a better way to do it than to just say, here, here's a map, here's your land. And Penn was a Quaker. Now understand that Quakers had been a very persecuted group in England. They were regarded with suspicion. Their rights were taken away because they were just different. They spoke in the old English, you know, thee and thou. They dressed in the old-fashioned way. They also had some controversial views. For one thing, Quakers were pacifists, meaning they were anti-war. And this raised a lot of suspicion because, you mean you won't fight, not even for your king? Well, that's going to cause a problem. The Quakers also believed that everybody had the Holy Spirit, or what they called God's inner light. Everybody. Now, we will not use the word equality. However, understand that Quaker women, because if everybody has the Holy Spirit, Quaker women had a lot more say in religious matters. If everyone has the Holy Spirit, that means you're going to have to treat Native Americans differently. So part of William Penn's Charter of Privileges, as it was called, stated that you had to purchase land. You could not take it from Native Americans. The American anti-slavery movement, or what we're going to call the abolitionist movement, was born with these Quakers. Because again, everyone has God's inner light, the Holy Spirit. Um, if we fast forward a little bit and get to 1791, just a couple years into our brand new nation, there was a Quaker petition that was brought to the House of Representatives calling for the immediate abolition of slavery. And it was incredibly controversial. It caused a big ruckus in Congress. Why? Because the biggest signature on the petition wasn't from a Quaker. It was from a guy who was not very religious, but he lived in Pennsylvania. And his name was Ben Franklin. All right, so, when we, again, when we talk about these middle colonies, we trace the Dutch ancestry. We see that there were Dutch roots there. The Dutch originally purchased Manhattan Island in New York City from natives. Uh, if we go to Pennsylvania and really focus on that, part of William Penn's charter of privileges, part of his, quote, holy experiment, that's the big money word, was this idea that you had an elected assembly in Pennsylvania. Now, in terms of these colonies, because you were so ethnically diverse, because you didn't have one religious group that could really domineer, you had more religious tolerance. The, the Quakers, who had been persecuted by the Puritans back in England, they were going to be a lot more religiously tolerant. Again, slavery, more prevalent than in New England, but part of Penn's charter of privileges was this guarantee of religious freedom. Uh, 
two more things that we'll talk about before we call the day today. One is this idea of history repeating itself and sometimes we just have to learn from our mistakes. The British, as time went on, made this attempt to kind of crack down on certain things. I am a cop and you will respect my authority. Now understand, the middle colonies are a perfect example of the economic system that we see throughout period two and into period three called mercantilism. And I need you to know this word tattooed on your forehead, name your firstborn child after. Anytime Mr. Eschbacher says mercantilism, you're gonna say, feed mama. Feed me! Let's practice. Mercantilism. Good. Uh, and in the late 1600s, the British passed a series of laws to enforce mercantilism known as the Navigation Acts. And this is a really, really important term. I need you to have down, guys. These Navigation Acts were designed to enforce mercantilism by basically trying to make it so that trade goods and money could not leave the empire. There were a series of restrictions. For example, trade can only go back and forth between the British colonies and Great Britain, the Mama country. Trade had to be done on either American or British ships. Three quarters of the crew members had to be British or American because the British did not want a single gold coin leaving the empire. There were also what were called enumerated goods, restricted goods. The British, for example, had passed what was called the Wool Act. They did not want American colonists raising sheep for wool because they didn't want competition for British wool producers. There was a Hat Act and an Iron Act which severely restricted the economic activity of these colonies. The British, and we kind of touched on this when we talked about New England, we'll talk about it more with the South, the British, for most of period two, really all of period two, didn't do a great job enforcing mercantilism. But the idea basically that they had bigger fish to fry. You know, they had to worry about the Spanish. They had to worry about the French. So they really kind of let the American colonists go, and we call this salutary neglect. Now, ultimately, after the Seven Years' War, when the British abandoned this policy of salutary neglect, that's what's going to basically set up the American Revolution. And it's amazing how they didn't learn from their history. During period two, they did try an attempt to administer the colonies, at least the northern ones, in a more strict manner. And that was called the Dominion of New England. And it was led by a guy named Edmund Andros, with the idea that basically you would take New York and all of those New England colonies and combine them together into one uber colony, the Dominion of New England. And Andros, in this short time that they had it, he really kind of ran things with an iron fist. He not only taxed, but he enforced taxes. He took away representative colonial governments. And ultimately, when the Glorious Revolution happened, that meant the downfall, the end of the Dominion of New England. But it's interesting how the British didn't pay attention to the fact that they got a lot of heat for this, they got a lot of kickback from the American colonies, and well, it's really what's going to set things up. Now, the other thing that we have to talk about is maybe the most important guy in colonial America. You know, when you were in ninth and 10th grade, you talked about the Enlightenment, okay? And certainly guys like John Locke are important in our course, Montesquieu is important, but in America, we had our own Enlightenment thinker. We had a guy who was so wealthy, he retired at the age of 42. We had a guy who invented anything he wanted. We had a guy who was a ladies' man, even though <laughs> he was married. Uh, he was a ladies' man on two different continents. You know, he really was Tony Stark. Big man in a suit of armor. Take that off, what are you? Genius billionaire playboy philanthropist. You're late to class. Okay, so we'll talk about the American version of Iron Man, Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin started off as a printer. He was apprenticed to a guy in Massachusetts, didn't like being there, ran off. Franklin made so much money on his own as a printer, again, he was able to retire at 42. And Franklin, more than anything else, if you were to give him a one-sentence mantra, would be, what would be useful? Franklin didn't tend to dabble in what was right or wrong, especially if you know how he lived his lifestyle, but Franklin was all about what would be useful, what would be a better way to do things. Franklin loved to swim. So he said, hmm, what would be useful? How could I swim better? So he invented swim fins. 
He was on board a ship called the Bonham Richard, which is French for Poor Richard, a ship named after his most famous book, Poor Richard's Almanac, which was a collection of funny sayings and useful little quotes, and he paid attention to the jet stream. Ben Franklin discovered the jet stream and how weather patterns happened. He also noticed that, geez, the, the ship was really getting tossed everywhere, and he said, wouldn't it be useful if you designed, well, what we now call a sea anchor, basically a parachute you stick out in the water. Ben Franklin designed what was called the Franklin stove because he looked at the stoves that commonly heated people's homes and said, boy, they're smoky, they waste a lot of heat, so he redesigned a wood-burning stove that would have more heat, less smoke. It was so efficient that when James Watt invented the steam engine, he had to send letters to Franklin to go, can you help me with the firebox so I can make it better? Franklin invented the public library system because wouldn't it be useful if you could borrow and return books for free so everyone could have access to books? He invented the fire department. Prior to Ben Franklin and Colonial America, if there was a fire, you just yelled and hoped people would bring buckets. Franklin invented an organized fire department. He created the American Philosophical Society called the Junto, J-U-N-T-O, because he wanted to have a collection of people who would get together and just think about things. It was Ben Franklin who invented mile markers. You know, you drive on the highway and you ask your parents, are we there yet? Well, Look on the highway, it was Ben Franklin who said, wouldn't it be useful if you had stones placed along the road to tell you how far you got? It was Franklin who organized America's first post office. It was Ben Franklin who invented daylight savings time, which we'll get to when we talk about the American Revolution. And it was Ben Franklin who makes Mr. Eschbacher feel old daily. See, Ben Franklin, and we'll talk about this story with the Revolution in period three, would attend these late night parties in France to wine and dine and schmooze with French aristocrats. And that's when he came up with the idea of daylight savings as a way to save candle wax. But along the way, sometimes Franklin, because he was so crafty, he would say things. Now imagine a, a French party, a salon, if you will. Franklin would make a statement, and when he did it, he would be looking at someone across the room just to see the reaction on their face, to see if maybe he could work that person. But he was an old guy, so he had to have his glasses on. The problem was, somebody would then pass Franklin a note. He's an old guy. He would have to switch his glasses to put his reading glasses on to be able to read the note. So what did Ben Franklin do? He invented bifocals. You know, one of those things us old people have to wear, where the top part of the glasses are to see for distance, and the bottom part are to see close objects like when you're reading. It was Ben Franklin who created something called the Albany Plan of Union, which we'll talk about when we get to the Seven Years' War. Franklin, who was involved in the writing of the Declaration of Independence, in the Constitutional Convention, essentially every major document in American history to that point, except for the Bill of Rights. That was Ben Franklin. Okay? So, that's the middle colonies. Remember the big ideas. Franklin is Iron Man. If I say mercantilism, you feed mama. And the British, they were kind of slackers with enforcing their authority when it came to sanitary neglect, except for that one bad idea with the Dominion of New England. And uh, lots of farmland. And the Quakers were pretty chill with everybody. Until next time, this is Mr. Ashbacher signing off saying, log off and put away your cronies, homies.